This is Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash, a podcast about everything that happens after Get Push. Ship It is brought to you by Fly.io, the home of changelog.com. Launch your apps close to your users all around the world. Learn how at fly.io. What's up, friends? I'm here with Sama Alam Naylor, Senior Developer Advocate at Sentry. So we've been working with Sentry for many years now, and I love Sentry. We use Sentry. It's so helpful for us. But we don't write many bugs here at Changelog. We're just that good. But I do say often how many teams use Sentry. And that number has grown over the years. It was 40,000, then it's 70,000, then it's 90,000, and now 100,000 plus teams use Sentry. Numbers don't lie. Check the NASDAQ scoreboard. Can you believe that, Sama? What are your thoughts on Sentry's impact to software teams? Do you know what? I'm not surprised. It's a quality product, and I'm not just talking about that because I work for Sentry, but because I've used Sentry. And I think its success is also due to the fact that it supports over 100 SDKs and frameworks. Like any programming language you want to use, unless it's ridiculously obscure, Sentry's got an SDK for that. Whether it's an official maintained SDK or whether it's a community SDK, there's a way that you can implement Sentry in your project with a few lines of code. You don't need to really do much to get its benefit. And uh, I think that's really powerful also in, in showing that people want to make Sentry work for their frameworks or their languages of choice because it works. And the fact that you can self-host Sentry as well, it, it shows how valuable it is and shows how valuable Sentry knows it is to people. The fact that it's open and out there and you can use it and configure it to your specifications at the code level if you want. And if you want to not bother about that and pay for it, then you can do that too. I'm not surprised and I'm not surprised that it's growing. I sound biased, obviously. Obviously, but it's the best error monitoring solution I have used in my dev career of many years. And as a front end dev, it feels intuitive. I think a lot of these error monitoring solutions are very back end focused. They're very stack tracy and not really geared up with a good developer experience. Like here are some logs, here are some things to spit out. You can read them if you care. But with Sentry, it seems to appeal to more developers because of the way it's been engineered. The amount of SDKs that that are available makes it appeal to more developers. And you can get started in Sentry in so many different frameworks in less than a minute. And, and all the instructions are in the app and they point you to documentation if you need it. It's you know a joy to use. And so I'm not surprised that that many people use it. I'm glad you're not surprised because I'm not surprised either. It's an amazing tool. We love it. We use it. Go to Sentry.io, use the code changelog that will get you $100 off the team plan it's basically three and a half months free or almost four months but code changelog will get you 100 bucks off the team plan use it love it century we love it century.io that's s-e-n-t-r-y dot i-o century.io Hello and welcome to Ship It, the podcast all about what happens after you get push. I am your host, Justin Garrison, and with me today is Autumn Nash. How's it going, Autumn? We're going to talk about Git today. I know this is actually like a Git show. And so it's everything after Git push. But today we're talking about some things that like are kind of close to Git push as well. But the main topic is is an interview with Maddie about Git T. And of course, I made the bad joke that maybe this was like secrets and, and rumors, but it's not. It's actually like a Git hosting. That he asked for get Dr. Pepper, y'all. Like, can we talk? Like, just like, look. Like, 23 flavors. Come I on, need, that's what we want. like, the Slack co like, community, the Twitter community. Let's, like, peer pressure Justin into liking coffee or tea because, like, this is ridiculous at this point. 
I'm drinking a lot less Dr. Pepper, okay? I'm trying to lose some weight and and that's not helping. So you know it's what? a lot of water. It's so rude that Justin can eat so much candy and drink Dr. Pepper and just be like skinny. It's rude. I'm definitely not as skinny as I was. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. We're trying to get better. And uh, it turns out that man. you know what I have not stopped thinking about, which is just it's a I read I read another white Tacos? paper. I don't think I, I don't oh, think okay. I sent you this one. It's just me. The person who had <laughs> the the longest fast ever. How long do you think? How did you get? Th- Dude, can we just talk? I absolutely love like your rando like. Like, th- how did you get a white paper about fasting? Like, I thought we were about to talk about some like infrastructure nope. thing, and then you were like, "It was a medical. It was a medical research paper." This is almost as bad as the time when you had Venn diagrams of Ricky Martin and what else was it? <laughs> it was Ricky Martin and it's not on my whiteboard anymore. I don't, it was uh, Living La Vida Loca was the overlap, but I don't remember what the middle was. It, you <laughs> oh it running was, unsigned kernel modules. That was what the- <laughs> like I sometimes I get a text from you and I am so confused. <laughs> Like I'm just like I know he's gonna loop it back at some point, but until we get there, like I mean, I, I bought my first Ricky Martin CD. So uh, in 2024, dude, yes, there is a like, root kit on it. I needed to have the CD. I needed to have the physical copy because it would it would if you have a Windows 2000 system or XP, maybe it will install a root kit, and that's fun. Because of Ricky Martin, yes. What? Okay, Sony. Decided. Sony, as the music company, was having problems in the early 2000s, late 90s of people copying their CDs, right? Like Apple's whole thing was like rip and burn your CDs and give them to your friends, basically. Uh, but rip and burn. And like Sony's like, you, we were, they assumed they were losing a lot of money. So they had this thing where they're like, hey, we need to DRM our files. But how do you DRM a CD that you give to someone and they have to be able to play it? Like this is like pre Spotify, right? Like Spotify does not exist. Spotify's assets now are DRM'd, but they, they control the player. So Sony has to control the player. So they're like, oh, well, we need to be able to make sure that you only play our songs through our player that we ship on the CD. Like you literally buy the CD and there's a real player. Remember real player back in the day embedded on this thing. But the file still exists. Also, do you remember like the like player like skins like those were so. Oh, okay. Winamp, Winamp skins are, are like, fire. Oh That's, I want like, that back. Yeah. Can we yeah. bring that back? OK, sorry. AD. But so real player, they ship it with <laughs> embedded real player, but the file still exists. So you could still like rip them out with something else. So what Sony decided to do was once you launch the CD, is auto run would install a rootkit on your computer that would not allow you to see the files on the disk and so it would hide the files and the only way that you could play them was with the embedded real player and it allows you to make up to three copies of the cd and you're like okay i can i can make a copy an authorized copy and it would keep track of that i don't know how uh but it would make an authorized copy and then that cd would also have the rootkit software on it and so it was literally a worm before worms went over the internet. Because if you put this CD in someone else's computer, it would install the rootkit and go all over again. So <clears throat> there were, I don't know, they got a, there was a big lawsuit. All this stuff happened. They ended up it's pulling like a bunch of CDs. Yeah. It is. It, it exactly. But they licensed this software from another company and they installed it on your computers. And, and you're telling me that it didn't waste more money coming up with this process, licensing the software, and then getting <laughs> I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you they uh, had ideas. Corporate America. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that was the the first thing I was talking about. The other thing I was talking about was like the fasting thing of like I I ended up on how long can is fasting healthy for you? And this guy named Angus back in the 60s. Fat, guess how long he fa- had a fast for? He did not eat. He he he'd drink water and zero calorie drinks like tea and coffee. Guess how long he fasted? With medical supervision. How long? 382 days. No. Mm-mm. He did not eat. Food is for the joys of life. 382 days. He lost 276 pounds. I bet he did, but like that sounds like a miserable existence. The man did not poop. <laughs> he whoa, pooped whoa. once every we went from every- <laughs> white paper to poop like this this is was like- in the white paper this was fascinating wait. he pooped once every six weeks how do you find white papers <laughs> on these things wait i thought your body can only go without food for five days no <laughs> like man went over a year without uh, eating but like, in the okay. entire year he pooped like uh, like seven times but what was he pooping if he didn't eat 
Okay, I have so many questions. Red blood cells are like a majority, supposedly like a majority, but I don't understand how this works. But he had medical supervision uh, and uh, they had they gave him supplements to like for like the vitamins he wasn't getting and stuff. But like it was off and on. He's like, oh, you don't need this anymore. Okay, go to the next. Thing. And like he just kept going. And it was super – the white paper is actually pretty short. Did he eat after this? Yeah. And how did his body just go back to digest? It doesn't just go back. Like you have to really yeah. ease into that. Actually, in the white paper, there was links to other white papers of of people that have died from long term fasting, and the majority of them died from either having preconditions that were aggravated by the fasting or by going back to eating in a not controlled way, and so they died after the fast was over because of the fasting. But yeah, I, I will link to this. So what you're saying is live happy and eat tacos. Is what you're saying. Tacos, ta- like, I, like, <laughs> if you're on a taco diet, like sure. <laughs> I have a whole book about taco diets. Hold on. Taco diets. I like how this is like the, trying to make a taco sound healthy. It, it is healthy. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to link to the white paper. I'll, I'll put in the show notes. Actually, I'm just going to put the Wikipedia page because the white paper is linked in the references there. And that's how I found it. And it was fascinating as a, as a evening read <laughs> of how long can you go without eating? Autumn, I don't need to see the book. Oh, she took off her headphones. <laughs> I believe I believe you it exists. I don't need to see it. <laughs> I have too many books. Wait, but I need to learn <laughs> that tacos are healthy in a whole, like, they're a whole diet in themselves. Just tacos are not healthy. We have to have a balance to this podcast, okay? It's your crazy fasting and my, like, tacos is healthy. Look, I can show you my Ricky Martin CD. I have it right here. I just it. hold on, hold on. <laughs> the taco cleanse? It's like a cleanse diet. Okay, hold up your Ricky Martin CD. This is like how wait. you're taking a screenshot, aren't you? This is yes. gonna be the next. <laughs> <laughs> when you go from infrastructure to taco cleanse, and like, did you take the picture? Wait, ah, no, wait, hold on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, smile. Oh. That's better. Do that face. <laughs> okay. Can we just talk about the end of the spectrum? Taco cleanse and your fasting and Ricky Martin sees. How do we end up here? Okay, keep going. <laughs> I don't remember how we ended up here. Instead of listening to Justin's fasting, listen to my taco cleanse. There's even vegan recipes. Vegan. I mean, I'd, I'd rather eat steak, but you know, whatever. Whatever, you know. Look at that. I'm going to send you a copy of this. We've got to fix you. We're going to have it in the show notes. We've got to fix you. The, ta- like, the best yes! taco recipes in the show notes. Taco We're going to put one, one recipe out each week and we're exactly. going to put it in the show notes. It's important. And like it's coffee cheese recipes. Cheese and flour tortillas. And I like corn tortillas, actually. I'm going to do corn tortillas, some cheese. And, it's gluten and free. Gluten salad. free. You see that? That's gluten mm. free. I mean, I love gluten, though. Some I love gluten, gluten too. We're like this. Like, <laughs> there's always guys who are like, really hot but then they're like oh i like <laughs> don't eat carbs for yes they're like i don't eat carbs and i'm like i pick like, bread okay not just picking coffee? the bear no? okay you're like out. it's you- not just picking the bear it's picking the carb and bread okay like <laughs> <laughs> this this intro is the furthest from anything we were going to talk about that i think we should just go over to the interview <laughs> Okay, go to the. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to we'll talk I to Maddie. I love it so much. <laughs> we'll talk to y'all after. All right, thank you so much for coming on the show, Maddie Ranta, a technical oversight committee member of the Git T Open Source Project. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, so I, this episode is just gonna be all Git, and it's gonna be fun. Um, what is Git T? Yeah, so uh, Gitty, it's an open source like uh, developer platform, like uh, self-host. It's a single Go binary. It has uh, Git hosting, uh, code reviews, uh, collaborating in issues, uh, package registry, and a CI CD that is GitHub Actions compatible. So the same YAML that would work on GitHub will work exactly the same way in our CI CD. So it's basically like open source GitHub. Yeah, exactly that. That's kind of like our... Uh, unofficial tagline so the t here isn't like rumors and and bad talk this is just like actual like exactly it's get with a cup of tea yeah okay but can we like spill tea while we're like uploading code certainly can uh you can 
add in uh, in the CI CD pipelines, you can add in like secrets detection. So your tea doesn't get leaked. <laughs> I like nice. it. Now I just wish that there was like a get Dr. Pepper. If that was like a thing, then we might. <laughs> Uh, so uh, along with being this open, that was a bad joke. No one even laughed. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> Justin doesn't drink coffee or tea and he's just like, we still love him anyways, but like, <sighs> how are you in tech and you don't drink coffee or tea, Justin? I get caffeine. It's all right. Uh, but back to Git tea as an open source project, it's available. You can run it yourself, but there's also like a Git tea website and, and, I'm assuming that's the the full blown like hey you can you can just go start using it right yeah so we have our, our flagship instance at uh, git uh, git uh, with a cup of tea g i t e a I have to spell it out <laughs> because sometimes people like to add a, a second t in there but yeah so um, I'm one man uh, shop for just managing the infrastructure for it right now and uh, I've been doing that for a few years now and. Being a flagship instance, we have to like make sure it's like uh, like highly available and like all that fun stuff. And it's gone through like an evolution uh, throughout the timeline. And eventually, we plan on dogfooding all of our repositories. We have most of them on the flagship instance right now, but just one remaining on GitHub. Okay, so it's hosted over on GitHub, but you can still deploy it over on on GitT. What does that infrastructure look like? Like, why? Like, what does it look like to run this at at some sort of scale? Because it's like I've run Git T in the past as like a single binary. Like, oh look, it's a container. I can run a thing. I get a website. What does that look like to do it at the scale you're doing it for, like a self or a hosted flagship? Yeah, it actually uh, looks uh, quite a lot similar to like running it on a like a NAS or a Raspberry Pi, even just a little bit more uh, redundancy. When we started off, we had um, an infrastructure provider that was providing us infrastructure and like credits, and so we wanted to leverage it. But it was uh, bare metal, so we had to build things up from scratch. And so we were doing uh, like a multi-node uh, Kubernetes environment with uh, Ceph for the uh, storage. I think if we were trying Kubernetes now, it'd be a different experience. But doing it vanilla, like several years ago. Uh, we were having to like rotate keys on each node manually, and that's a lot of complexity and a lot of ops work for a one-person infrastructure team. Exactly. Uh, so we eventually actually just changed it to like a single server, and I uh, forgot about Ceph entirely. Just we still get that redundancy with the secondary uh, version, you might say, and uh, just offloading it to the provider over a network share. They handle the raid version that you're supposed to use now and it worked great single nodes hardly any like uh need for like massive resource requirements i think it was just a few gigs of ram a few cores for that one server but due to like being single node and not really like behind a load balancer if anything happened to that server it was like there's a lot of (laughs) it kind of sucked what's your failover whole process look because i mean that's like a lot of pressure when you're hosting someone else's code and how they work and how they can contribute with somebody else like that's like you know some websites if they go down okay you can't buy a t-shirt but if yours goes down like that is major for your customers you know because they can't access what they're working on and they can't uh work with other people so like how do you navigate that as one person running the infrastructure and actually uh it's just a uh, point of clarification this is just gitty.com so we don't have any customers of this site so uh there's no like paid sla there's a managed SaaS uh that is offered through a company that has it's going through like the SOC 2 compliance and um has redundancy it's dedicated instances per customer and it has all that fun reliability but yeah gitty.com even though we don't have uh paying customers it's like important for reputation not to have that downtime and with like no failover or nothing it's just like it was cost effective but it wasn't really like uh great because uh, we did have issues uh, like dealing with um, like denial of service attacks people just uploading like their entire dropbox and speeding <laughs> up all of our space and so why in the beginning you, you had a cloud provider or a hosting provider it's like here's some metal boxes why did you pick 
Kubernetes and Ceph. Like those are those are fairly complex technologies that that have their own requirements. Like why did you go straight to that as like the let's go do this side instead of just doing like you're doing a single node? Yeah, it was uh, mainly because uh, we uh, just the royal we. It was just kind of planning for scale that we weren't at yet. It's there's this fancy new software out of Google. You can web scale. It's going to be great. It's going to solve all of your problems. And um, it, we definitely weren't ready for it at the time. And if we were to go to like EKS or GKE, um, we definitely would be ready for it now. And it's um, we have a Helm chart that a ton of people install GT on their clusters and high availability. Just really all the stuff that we were doing manually just handled out of the box now. Uh, so. With all the downsides of that single node, we uh, ended up uh, switching to Amazon uh, for our provider, where like we could do a lot more like quote unquote cloud native stuff, like using like RDS, uh, throwing up uh, the release artifacts into S3, and using like Cloud Prime for a CDN to just take off all the load that we would be getting to that single node, and if like the node went down. The files would still be available like, through the CDN for release artifacts and being able to like manage things with infrastructure as code and GitOps and all that fun stuff. And so all the infrastructure stuff is like I want to say solved right now. There's some issues around uh, global latency. Uh, we're hosted. Uh, we're moving to the eastern U.S., uh, but there's latency issues in like Australia and Europe for that specific region. And so planning on how to like make sure the site is globally distributed with making sure everyone has like reasonable response time when they're visiting the site. And so there's infrastructure planning going into that right now. And it's feeding into the software project planning to be able to like do more HA and like distributed. You mentioned using things like S3 and RDS now, the, the components of Git T require a base or, or at least want an external database some sort of storage for for artifacts but i'm assuming like the git files aren't stored in s3 right like are those still like on disk somewhere technically git doesn't need an external database uh you can just use a sqlite file you don't need like even a reverse proxy it will handle like acne uh, cert renewal and everything uh but we have these uh, areas of the software that allow you to like Kind of like row with whatever like you have like if you don't want to like use like redis as a cache you can like use in memory as a cache um but then if you have like more like traffic more like users of the site you can like scale everything out to use a proper database mysql postgres etc and if you want to store those release artifacts avatar uploads that can go up to s3 but like you said, uh, like Git repos themselves have to be stored on disk because uh, Git is extremely sensitive to like disk latency because you can't just have like Git read from S3. You have to like read the pack file, parse it. It's it's a lot of file reads. It is it yeah. is a lot of file reads and a lot of storage. Mm -hmm. And like even like uh, like the repo homepage, if you're just browsing the homepage, it's list of files and then the latest commit for like each file so you can see like uh how and what the last time was updated what the last commit message for the file was so you can just have some uh, added context when browsing around the repository each one of those isn't you don't necessarily get all that information through uh, one git cli call and so having it up in s3 uh, would just be way too like slow for anyone to like browse the site reasonably so you have to have it on disk and one of the things in the roadmap for Gitty is being able to uh, separate out the repositories to different nodes. Because right now you need one disk and it reads from that one disk. So instead of just having it one disk, we'd be able to have a clustered option. So if you want repo A, you can talk to node A and read the files on there and pass it through. And it's like a, just an external storage server. It's just like, hey, just handle these files. Yeah, so I'd uh, be like uh, scaling out with additional nodes. Um, and that would reduce some of the latency concerns because you're still reading all that information from disk. Um, and you need to read just exactly what you need from the 
get files and pass it over. So list of files in repository, your latest commit message, and pass that over uh, like gRPC or something to the node that wants that information instead of having to like load the entire pack file, parse through it, and uh, find out all that information. So that's uh, something that we're feeding into the uh, software roadmap as well. Are you the only maintainer for this project, or are you just for the infrastructure? Just for the GT.com infrastructure, we have close to 50 community maintainers of the software project, um, 44,000 GitHub stars, I think maybe 70,000 registered users on Gitty.com uh, with a significant number of repositories. Why do people pick you over GitHub? Is like the main, I guess, value prop the fact that you are the open source version of GitHub and you're not a corporate entity? Or let's say that I was in the market to switch my repositories from GitHub to Git. Are all the Git commands generally the same? And using it generally the same, I know you said your GitHub action compatible. I uh, Git is completely the same, uh, push, pull, phone. And the experience is similar with uh, pull requests and that. Uh, there's um, some things with our project Kanban boards where GitHub is introducing their new project interface, um, as well as uh, implementing AI at time. And there is a corporate entity that is. Um, supporting the project and uh, providing like bounties to maintainers and is uh, paying for the Gitty.com infrastructure. The reason why you would choose us is you wouldn't necessarily choose Gitty.com because then you get into the issue of centralization. And that's kind of what we're trying to like push away from. We're trying to direct people more to self-hosts um, to uh, maintain data sovereignty over their codes. Uh, and having that single binary being able to run anywhere on the smallest Raspberry Pi up to, um, at one point I heard uh, the Cray Supercomputer Company was running Gitty. I probably not on their uh, mainframes, but definitely interesting that uh, that company uh, was uh, utilizing our software. I think that's a really interesting proposition about Gitty as a product is is pluggable as far as like it's a single container that can do all this stuff locally for my house right like if i'm the only user of it and i want a web interface and some nice runners or whatever internally at my house like i could do that um, and then the scaling aspect of it is it is a monolith in the regard of like you could just do all this stuff by default here and it just it has limits to what it can scale and then once you say I hit those limits, I say I need an actual database, I want some caching, I want uh, more storage, whatever, you have components that can break out there. But that is very similar to how GitLab works, right? Like GitLab is is a very similar frame of like, they. I think by default, I haven't run GitLab for a little while, but I used to. And it has a few extra components that you need up front, uh, but most of the, the monolith is there. And you're like, oh, if I want some runners to be external, I can break those out into things. And then GitHub as an enterprise product where you can run that yourself as, as well, like they'll give you VM images. And most of that is self-contained, but that's a, a definitely a, a enterprise uh, management uh, solution where it takes a lot more to run a GitHub instance than Git T for sure. At least from my experience running, running all three at some point in my, in my lifetime. It is interesting the three different options and how they contrast, because I think people usually start with GitHub, you know, and there's so many, so much documentation and so many, like, I guess, draws to get people to start there but GitLab is you know its own component and definitely a contender but it's just interesting how all three like contrast each other and how you can pick like a very simple form of that that doesn't really need a lot of overhead knowledge and just you focus on learning the git but you can also get to the like running your own instance and everything you said you said get a lot of in that sentence it was get because get and get and i was great but <laughs> <laughs> well because i think people also don't like when you first start out you don't realize that github and get are two different things right so then people get to focus on not the infrastructure instance but just learning the actual git that you need to know to do that right and then learning the contrast between the different options is a whole nother base of knowledge, I guess. And I think that the business model here of Git T and GitHub are, are extremely different where every time I've worked with GitHub, they always want you to use the hosted version of GitHub, whether that's a, a private
I've never worked at a place that had an up-to-date GitHub internally. Like they're always out of date. Well, I don't, I feel like that's kind of the difference between corporate America and open source, right? Like one, they need you to use their product because like, if not, it's not cost efficient to run a product. Right. And then the other one, it's usually built out of a need, a want or wanting to do better, you know? So like, cause if not, why would you volunteer your time to build something or rebuild? Like you wouldn't redo the wheel unless there was a good reason. So I feel like it, it tracks. <laughs> like, but just the fact that Git T really wants you just to go run your own, right? Like that's the business. Like we make it as simple as possible or you make it as simple as possible to like, please just go run it and, and own that, that side of it. And there are, you know, looking even at your product page, like there's an enterprise version, there's a, a, a hosted version. Like you don't have to actually maintain the servers for it, but you can, uh, it is a simple enough thing at small scales. What was your motivation for wanting people to be able to like run their own? Cause I think that's the interesting component, right? Like, Everybody is so used to not running their own and then you just you're giving this away. Like what made you feel like that was important to be able to give people access to that ability and to be able to offer that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, like philosophically, um, like uh, free and open source software is it just makes sense, I guess. Um, being able to like see the codes uh, of the things and be able to work with it. It's just like when you buy a car, you can like make modifications to the engine and do that. If you own a house, you can like change out the lights that you want. So you're not, you don't have to pay a subscription for like the type of light bulb. And not yet. This is 2024. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> there are some bulbs that do require subscriptions. <laughs> also, it's wild. Like just like stuff like the fact that heated seats is becoming something that like <laughs> companies can charge after you bought the car. Like, I just, who knows at this point? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's just like being able to like actually like see what you're running and have full control over that. And so that's um, like why I went in like with open source mindset and being involved in other open source projects as well and contributing uh, for uh, quite a long time. It just made sense. And previously working in enterprise, um, even uh, before Microsoft bought GitHub, we were prevented from like uploading stuff to GitHub because you just can't, you know, like you need like a relationship, all that fun stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm familiar with that experience. How can I like, have that experience in my day to day, and it's just like GitLab is like the most prominent example. And I, I tried to run that, and I didn't have the uh, computational resources to be able to run it. I'm like, okay, well, there has to be something else. And at that time, uh, Githy was just started. I found it, and it's just like this is like basically what I need. And so I used it, and then I'm like, well, there's some things that I'm running to and so I contributed some bug fixes and then it's just like, okay, well now there's some like functionality that I like and I just kept on contributing and eventually became a maintainer and then project lead and now a member of the technical oversight committee and it's just been like eight years uh, working on GT and um, yeah. And still the main the main thing that you have that's different is like you don't want people to use gitt.com, right? Like that's still like it's there. It people it's people can it's available, but really you want people to go run it themselves or 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 have a hosted version of some sort. But not like the flagship version is there to show people how it can work, right? It's not necessarily like I shouldn't rely on production in this environment. Oh well, I know you can definitely rely on this, and we're um, like we do have limitations on like users who sign up right now, but we're uh, looking at opening it up even more because, like, there's um, several like indie games that are uh, building on it because, uh, like, you need a ton of uh, storage for indie game. Like, if you're video game assets and they don't necessarily have that um, in any way that they can open up with the people that they're collaborating with. So, like, Gitty.com, because our limits are uh, friendlier than like GitHub.com and GitLab.com. Can you explain the difference in your limits between you and GitHub and GitLab? Yeah, so um, with like video game development, you don't want to store uh, binary files in Git because when you try to version those, it basically just stores a copy every time you make a change, which um, even if it's just like you're storing a Word document, which uh, Word documents are technically zips, and you change a word, um, that 
uh, changes the entire binary blob, and then you get a double, like you get a copy of the file as your next commit. And so you've just doubled your storage just for that one file. And with video games, you have a ton of uh, binary assets for the artwork and cut scenes with like video files, and it just can grow and grow and grow. And for like GitLab and uh, GitHub, they have uh, hard limits on the size of uh, Git LFS storage that you can have. Um, Git LFS is a way of uploading those uh, large binary files off into something. Is it stand for large file system or large file yeah, storage? Yeah, it is both yeah, large brilliant storage, and very yeah. like picky very sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it can either, it makes your life both easier and so painful but there it serves a purpose (laughs) for sure (laughs) yeah and it's great because like just like how like in with this is a terrible example but i'm going to use it anyway with nfts and the blockchain you're not actually storing an image on the blockchain you're storing a reference pointer to somewhere else to a url and that's what uh, git lfs does is you're just storing that pointer to wherever you're actually hosting the file so we can throw those files into S3 or uh, an alternative. And um, when you're building huge binaries, it makes your life so much. It makes things possible that it <laughs> might not have been, but it is very painful. <laughs> Having come from or, or worked at a, a studio that made a lot of assets, like all of the asset revision systems at like animation studios and game streamers, like it's separate. It's you, you, you store that out of Git as much as you can. Like you have a separate thing that's like, we need to version a bunch of assets and we're going to make a petabyte of information uh, based on these assets for every version. So you need to be able to reference them and go back to them if you're rendering scenes or you need to like say, oh, what changed here? Because now the poly, like the actual like graph on top of it looks different or doesn't render right. We have to go back and see what we changed uh, to figure that stuff out. And that, all that stuff you do not want to get. <laughs> see, when you're building a language, it's like you need GIF LFS because you need to store like the binaries. So like, you know, but you also can't be like you don't want to run that like a whole binary file every time you upload and like commit and everything. So it's like, it is very important. I once tried to store repos like, like package repos in Git um, and oh, get no. out LFS. It was a bad, <laughs> it was a bad idea. Um, it, it just, yeah. It, it's one of those, like it's a necessary evil when you need it, but like, if you don't need it, don't use it. <laughs> like, <laughs> And so our limitations are, um, like, we have soft limitations on, like, LFS and our repo sizes. Eventually, when we implement, like, if you want to host on Gitty.com, instead of getting a managed instance yourself, we'll, like, we'll have, like, more sets, quotas, and whatnot. But, um, like, right now, it's uh, a lot more uh, friendlier and more relaxed than GitHub with 70 million people. We have, uh, like, maybe... Uh, 70,000 people on our site so it's uh, a scale of difference like understandably like uh, github like you have to like be firm with those limits um and i mean people more people will abuse it for sure which <laughs> which you're hitting these limits. if you give someone anything for free someone's going to find a way to make that and abuse it not just that but it's been it's wild the way people have abused compute power and storage in weird ways <laughs> like like i love that like the most interesting thing about being a developer is making a product and then seeing like the ridiculous hood rat stuff that customers will do with whatever you make. Like you're just like, I didn't even think of that. Like, but okay. <laughs> like, it's amazing. Yeah. So, um, like we're starting to like deal with issues of like spam, uh, more heavily involved DDoS and file hosting and virus and command and control stuff on our site. And so, like we've had to build, um, like I've built some automation around like detection. So because a lot of the spam is uh, pretty easily detectable. There's uh, patterns and it's like uh, you can check out IP ranges against like, like lists and everything to be like, hey, this is like kind of suspicious. And everything like gets flagged for like human review. We don't do like completely block people automate automatically, but. A lot of it is just from the software itself. Like we'll send webhooks to our detection system on every uh, comment um, and feed it into um, like our engine to be like, hey, it's kind of weird. There's lots of links in here, or we've uh, looked at the link and it's like the domain is like a malware link, and it's like 
uh, then we'll like restrict that account, uh, send a ping and just, like maybe like, like take a look at this and like they won't be able to like post anymore until like it gets reviewed. And um, file hosting sends a webhook, uh, files get scanned. Yes, no, hey, maybe somebody should take a look at it. Uh, but some stuff that we're discovering is being able to like put onto the roadmap of Gitty itself of uh, detecting like username or uh, bio changes. Right now we have uh, database triggers to be able to like send, hey, this has been updated to our engine. But we're using our experience on Gitty.com to feed into the software itself of instead of having to have the trigger in the database uh, send the ping, maybe build out webhooks for user uh, changes. Uh, so if somebody changes their biography, their like URL, it can uh, get sent somewhere. It's interesting how those things evolve for when you know and trust your customers or you work with someone that like, hey, no, I know this person. They work down the hall or, or where they exist in Slack versus strangers on the Internet, which are probably not real people and, and controlled by. It's like you have to build in all these protections as things get popular, but also as just you don't know where people are coming from um, and that. It's a different problem of scale, right? Because like you can have a private version of Gitty and you can scale your company to 10,000 users and you don't have any of those problems because they're all people that have their employees at the company and they they have contracts and all that stuff that's just like, oh, I can enforce this because I know the people uh, versus the internet. This is like we, we run a thing for 70,000 people or 70,000 accounts. I think even if you're running something internally, whether you can go up three floors and be like, dude. Or if somebody like works in another country, like it's still different, like depending on like how big of the scale. But I definitely think something for customers like is a whole nother level. Like I said, also, it's just it's weird to me the way people see software and they're like, I'm going to use it for this odd thing. Like it could be a legitimate use, but it's just something that you may have never thought of. And it's such a wild edge case that then you then have to go back to the drawing board and rethink of how to make sure it doesn't break everything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Actually, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, was there anything in Gitty's like feature set over eight years you've been running it that you had to rethink your infrastructure like oh actually lfs support landed how are we going to do that what, what were the any like the key features that made you rethink what you were doing definitely lfs was uh, the first big one because it was just running to disk right away and immediately that was like you could see our repo sizes ballooning um and not being able to scale and so um, being able to offload that onto S3 just um, like was a savior because immediately those huge files you can just like forget about on disk. You don't need to worry about the latency of like Git reading uh, the repository because uh, the files are just like pointers. Um, all the commit information is still on disk. It's just when you're loading the file, you'll just call up S3 and say, hey, can I have this file? And then it will load up. That's actually really smart to put that in S3 because it's already highly available. Exactly. And then it's LFS, then packages. Um, a, one of our German maintainers uh, built out our package um, like skeleton of being able to add on support for like a bunch of uh, new packages. But he initially implemented around like 20 of them. So first was like Docker, so you can store Docker in it, um, like Maven, NPM, RPMs, uh, dot devs, and just like a bunch. And again, huge like file sizes if you're like pushing a Docker image for each uh, commit and it's just that file size can balloon. And so it's just um, pushing up to S3 again made sense. And, and finally was um, about a year ago was when we implemented our uh, CI CD and being able to think about how we were going to implement that in terms of like if you're on a single node versus like a huge instance of being able to like uh, take into account. And luckily, I and a few other maintainers, we've uh, we are either like maintainers or contributors uh, to several other um, CI CD systems. So we've been able to like leverage our experience. Uh, using those and like feeding it back into Gitty, and also for like the first 
six years uh, before we implemented uh, CICD and Giti, we actually just ran a drone.io instance for our CICD. And uh, the lovely folks at Aquanex Metal uh, sponsored uh, the servers for that for quite some time, including the works on ARM program so we could uh, test our software on ARM. And we got obscenely powerful like servers from Equinix, just all of the cores, all of the RAM. Those are Ampere servers at Equinix, and they're super fun. Uh, I just I just had a chance to do some streams with them, uh, testing my software at work, and yeah, yeah it's just like, oh, I need two hundred fifty six cores. Okay, like I don't know what I'm going to do with these, but yeah. it's very powerful. <laughs> you mentioned that you contributed to other open source projects. What else? What other open source projects do you contribute to? Of course, yeah. Um, I've contributed to uh, uh, Drone.io, the CI/CD. There's a fork of it called Woodpecker that I've also contributed to. I maintain uh, several Golang uh, libraries for automation. There's probably the biggest thing outside of Giti that I do is something called Xgo that lets you com- cross-compile Golang binaries on two different platforms. Normally, Go lets you do this with just like changing a few environment uh, variables and like, hey, this is like targeting Windows now, and you just say go build uh, target Windows. Unless you're using C Go, which is pretty common for uh, the SQLite library uh, for Golang, is uh, using C Go. So you can't uh, use all those just fun tricks of like with the Go command line just to build a binary for if you're on Linux, building it for Windows or for Mac and uh, vice versa. So uh, Xgo is a project uh, that was originally created for the Ethereum Go projects, uh, but it uh, went by the wayside. Uh, the maintainer wasn't able to support it, so I uh, picked it up. I added support for uh, different targets, um, PowerPC, FreeBSD, Linux slash PowerPC, FreeBSD slash AMD64, because it's not just the OS, it's the CPU architecture that you need to target as well. And uh, built in automations to be able to, uh, when a new Go version uh, is released, then like a new version is tagged and built. Because the way that it works is you're actually just distributing the the headers of the like development library. So like you'll have the kernel headers, uh, the GCC, stuff for like multi-lib and whatnot. And so it's a great big beefy binary that take or a uh, Docker container that takes a ton of time to build. So I just have a cron job that checks uh, go.dev whenever a new version of Go is out, builds it, pushes it. And I need a link. I was trying to look it up. I found one that was archived, uh, but literally I, I was trying to rebuild some software for i686 uh, to run on an emulator that runs on my iPad. Um, so it's, uh, but yeah, that architecture is the, what they emulate there is not, uh, what I normally have on my desktop. And I think I was getting hung up on the Seagull stuff. The decision you have for the CICD, when you implemented that and being compatible with GitHub actions, did that impact your architecture or how you implemented it? Because it's very different than drone and different than GitLab and and the other ones. So were you basically rebuilding or, or recreating GitHub actions for your own infrastructure or were you parsing that and translating it to something else? Yeah. So uh, there's a few components to our uh, Gitty actions. One of the biggest components uh, is already solved and it's using uh, the mm-hmm. act project, okay. which is, um, like just being able to execute like GitHub actions on your command line. It will execute it all in a Docker container locally. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to actually like um, commit some pushes. And so rather than people like going down the project, run it locally, um, we uh, built that connection between uh, the server and runner. And we had to like daemonize act itself and then be able to uh, connect it to the server to be able to like uh, pull for jobs and like send back the logs to the server. So there were some decisions architecturally that we had to make, like how it was built, because with uh, Drone uh, previous to version two, it used uh, gRPC on a different port and Woodpecker does the same. And uh, even like sending updates to the user, they did uh, server-side events, which is deprecated in the browsers. And so 
and don't play well with enterprise firewalls sometimes and it's a whole thing. And so we needed to like take all those lessons learned and feed them into Git. So uh, we're still doing gRPC communication between the server and uh, runner, uh, but we're feeding it through our uh, router itself instead of having like a different listener on a different port. It's uh, just talking through our uh, Qi router to be able to like call those actions and having those uh, long lived uh, connections with the runner to be able to, instead of like opening up a new connection and pulling for jobs. I run a runner behind my firewall. It connects to my Git T instance over gRPC and my runner is basically running the act command as a daemon listening for those jobs. Who's it gets a new job. And then it's just it, cause the act runner is the actual piece that does the, the GitHub action parsing and say like, okay, I know how to run this now in a container. Exactly. Yeah. And we do have to have some on the server as well, because we need to know in advance which actions to call, because if it's a, like a push, a tag, an issue comment, we need to like put that into our uh, pipeline of like, Hey, here's this uh, new task that a runner needs to pick up. And then the runner will pick it up, parse the YAML of like, okay, what do I actually need to do uh, what containers do I need to pull down to build this? What uh, action files and all that fun stuff, and then send it back. I just want to go all the way back to like the beginning here of of wrapping this up with like Git T started as this very simple Git server web interface for Git. Basically, like I can push things to a website and then it stores files on disk. That grew into having a lot of other features, and you wanted this Git T.com as a website for the flagship. So you started off with Kubernetes and Ceph as the storage backend, and you're like, this is kind of terrible for what we're trying to do, for the people we have to manage it, and, and the amount of moving parts you have to basically have a website that stores some files. Uh, so then you switch over to like the single node instance, where it's just like, hey, we don't actually have HA, but we can vertically scale this thing. No problem. The simplicity of Git T is what's giving you those benefits again of saying, like, hey, we just did a web interface with file backend and some extra, you know, extra features on, on the side that are kind of optional for a lot of it. Um, but then adding adding things like package management and LFS and and all of these other pieces kind of rules that out and just the HA ability because you still are encouraging people go run this yourself. And at that point, you have EC2 with ELB and S3. Basically, it's just like the core fundamentals of like, here's here's what we get in this cloud environment. And I'm assuming that's just like a load balancer with an auto scaling group, right? For like the Git T instances, more or less. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And so you're routing, you have some auto scaling groups that are just like, hey, these need to auto scale if we have too many requests or we're hitting a limit or something. Cycle them out, do those upgrades. All of that stuff just happens generally as an auto scaling group can do. Um, and then you also get the benefits of like, oh, we can, we can software, well, not software define, but we can, we can define some of this in reusable code, Terraform, whatever, and say like, oh, we can, we can spin it up and test it and do these other things. And, and you're still this entire time encouraging people like, go run this yourself, like go, we've run the gamut of like where you should run this and like depending on how much how much experience you have in kubernetes or how big your team is you might want to do the helm chart if you just want to have the web interface with file system go run the run our container uh in as a standalone sort of thing and scale it up as needed or if you want it in a cloud environment as, as a private hosted thing you can you could subscribe to it but also you could do the auto scaling group and and ec2 with EL, uh, elb files right like that's like the entire spread like you've done them all with the main websites and now you've like you can be very informed about how customers uh, or users of the software should use it like hey what scale are you at what do you need uh here's some things you might want to think about and then also another important part of the flagship is being able to dog boot our own project it's we have most of our stuff there it's one remaining thing it's just with eight years of history 30,000 issues and pull requests Ooh, and yeah. countless number of comments and reactions and labels and just getting that metadata into our migrate over is we completed a migration for another open source project uh, to self host on Gitty and they just hit their 20th year. Um, and previously they were on a different system that didn't use the pull request issue. Uh, mindsets they were it's the mailing list patch mindset yeah yeah i mean the metadata and process is the real tech debt 
right? Like those are the things that are really actually hard to, to migrate, like a language or a framework or whatever, like, ah, you, you got to invest some time. But like, if you're in a different mindset of how you manage the software and release the software, like that's the stuff that takes a long time to migrate. Yeah. And dog fooding is also incredibly important to like even see, uh, not just like maintaining that infrastructure, but using on a day to day and feeding back into the development process as well. Well, thanks for t- bringing us down that trip of, of what key, Git T has gone through and, and kind of what it's used for. Um, cause that's fascinating just to see, like, as, as someone who's run a couple of these things internally, like I've never had to scale them beyond, you know, a couple hundred users. And in most cases, that's like, ah, eh, you could do the defaults. It's, it's pretty fine. Um, but it's cool seeing from, uh, from scaling ba- literally from nothing of like, we just have some servers, uh, up to where you're at now with scaling to, you know, tens of thousands of users. It's really cool. Thanks. Yeah. Also, it's hard to store your own code, so I can't imagine doing all of the planning to store like other people's code and not knowing the constraints that you're going to be under. That's a lot of planning and design and figuring well, yeah, out. Yeah, once you're dependent on your own software, uh, your requirements change. <laughs> yes, like I can't even imagine. It'll be fun. It'll be a wild ride. Like you'll learn a lot for sure. Yeah, and a big shout out to all of the people who. Uh, like giving me advice and like helped out with this infrastructure because yeah it's like i'm typing in commands but like there's like a ton of people in our community that are like giving feedback and like hey this is uh, like a pattern that i've used before and all that and so it's just like yeah it's i'm typing in the commands but it's definitely not just me there's a ton of people that this would not be possible without awesome community thank you so much maddie for coming on and explaining it we will have links uh, to some of the stuff we talked about in the show notes and uh, we'll talk to you again soon awesome thanks so much What's up, friends? I'm here in the breaks with David Shu, founder and CEO at Retool. If you didn't know, Retool is the fastest way to build internal software. So, David, we're here to talk about Retool. I love Retool. You know that. Been a fan of yours for years. But I'm on the outside, and you're clearly on the inside, right? You're, you're on the inside, right? I think so. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> okay, cool. So, given that you're on the inside and I'm not on the inside, who is using Retool and why are they using Retool? Yeah. So the primary reason someone uses Retool is typically they are a backend engineer who's looking to build some sort of internal tool and it involves the front end. And backend engineers typically don't care too much for the front end. They might not know React, Redux, all that well. And they say, hey, I just want a you know, simple button, simple form on top of my database or API. Why is it so hard? And so that's kind of the core concept behind Retool is front end web development has gotten so difficult in the past five, 10, 20 years. It's so complicated today. Put together a simple form with a submit button, have to submit to an API. You have to worry, for example, about, oh, you know, when you press the submit button, you got to bounce it, or maybe you got to disable it when it's, you know, is fetching is true. And then when it comes back, you got to enable the button again. When there's an error, you got to display the error message. There's so much crap now with building a simple form like that. And Retool takes that all away. And so really, I think the core reason why someone would use Retool is they just don't want to build any more internal tools. I want to save some time. Yeah, clearly the front end has gotten complex. No doubt about that. I think even front enders would agree with that sentiment. And then you have back end folks that already have access to everything, API keys, production database, servers, whatever. But then to just stand up Retool, to me, seems like the next real easy button because you can just remove the entire front end layer complexity. You're not trying to take it away. You're just trying to augment it. You're trying to give developers a given interface, that's Retool, build out your own admin, your own view to a Google Sheet or to the production database, all inside Retool. Let Retool be the front end to the already existing back end. Is that about right? Yeah, that is exactly right. The way we think about it is we want to abstract away things that a developer should not need to focus on, such that a developer can focus on what is truly specific or unique to their business. And so the vision of what we want to build is something like an AWS, actually. 
where I think AWS really fundamentally transformed the infrastructure layer. Back in the day, developers used to spend all their time thinking about how do I go rack servers? How do I uh, go manage cooling, manage power supplies? How do I upgrade my database without it going down? How do I uh, change out the hard drive while still being online? All these problems. And they're not problems anymore because nowadays when you want to upgrade your database, just go to RDS, you press a few buttons. And so what AWS did to the infrastructure layer is what we want to do to the application layer specifically on the front end today. And for me, that's pretty exciting because as a developer myself, uh, I'm not really honestly that interested, for example, in managing infrastructure in a nuts and bolts way. You know, I would much rather be like, hey, you know, I want an S3 bucket, boom, there's an S3 bucket. I want a database, boom, there's a database. And similarly, on the front end or on the in the application layer, there is so much crap people have to do today when it comes to building a simple CRUD application. It's like, you know, you probably have to install 10, 15, maybe even 20 different libraries. You probably don't know what most of the libraries do. It's really complicated to load a simple form. If, you know, you're probably downloading almost like a megabyte or two of JavaScript. It's so much crap to build a simple form. And so that's kind of the idea behind Retool is could it be a lot simpler? Could we just make it so much faster? Could you go from nothing to a form on top of your database or API in two minutes? Well, we think so. Yeah, I think so too. So listeners, Retool is built for scale. It's built for enterprise. It's built for everyone. And Retool is built for developers. That's you. You can self-host it, you can run in the cloud, a custom SSO, audit log, SOC 2 type 2, professional services. Starting with Retool is simple, fast, and of course, it's free if you want to try it right now. So go to retool.com slash changelog. That's R-E-T-O-O-L dot com slash changelog. Thank you so much, Maddie, for coming on the show and talking to us all about Git T and the infrastructure behind it and kind of the challenges you faced uh, throughout running that. That's really fascinating just to see what like a public website, that's what, that's what this podcast is all about. Like I want to talk to people that run things on the internet and face challenges that we probably didn't think of when I run it at home or I spun it up on my computer, whatever. Um, that's the fun stuff to me. Also, it's really interesting just the idea of, I don't know. Things are kind of getting weird right now with like what happens when other people host your things or like how we were saying with like cars, like all of a sudden needing like you're paying monthly for like heated seats or just I don't know. The world's in a weird place. So I just wonder like if one day get tea may be an option that we didn't know that we needed, you know, like so it's interesting. Just You're really hung up on those heated seats, aren't you? Dude, I'm, how does that happen? <laughs> how do you own a car? And then they're like, oh, by the way, like I had, I bought my car and then I had a Toyota like app and it was like free. And then all of a sudden they were like, you have to pay $12 a month to start your car. And I was like, I thought yeah. once you bought a self-starter, like you just had it. And now like you have to pay monthly for the, like. I bought my first new car in 2020, the Subaru, and I like it. But yeah, it was a subscription to be able to start the car remotely and uh, and have an app. Yep. That's wild to me. Like that it's like I feel like they make it harder and harder to be financially like smart because you can't just buy things and pay it off because now they're like You can't own things. Yeah. Right? Like there's no ownership that you're like, "Ah, oh, I have like this weird partnership with my yes. car." Yeah. <laughs> Like, I get that you have to maintain an app and stuff and all that good stuff, but it is wild the way that, like, they've changed. But we used to have remote starters on cars. Like, I installed remote That's starters on saying. cars back in the day, and it was just a button on my remote, and it would start the car. And you don't have to have a web service. Yeah, you pay, like, $1,000, you get this, like, remote key, and then you start your car. Like, And then also, like, do you know how much it sucks when, you're, like, your Wi-Fi is messed up or something and you can't start your car and then you have to, like, switch back to it, – it, it's wild, like, the new – My first four cars cost $1,000. Like, each one I, – I would buy – it was $1,000. I would fix it up. I would sell it for $1,000 and I'd buy the next one. And I did that for four cars and it was great. The price of cars now is just wild. But I think that all this is going to, like – change the way that we have finances too right because if like but back in the day when i started art school you would buy a version of adobe photoshop usually with like student loans or whatever your first money and then you'd use it until it like had a feature you needed now you know another one or your computer completely like you know died and you had to get a new computer so you needed a new license but now you have to pay like adobe photoshop every month and like artists already don't make a lot of money you know what i mean and then now it's just wild. Like, 
things are going to, we're switching how people pay and own. Hey, if you want to own some software, check out Git T, right? I mean, that was the whole, <laughs> it's like literally this model. That's what I'm saying. So that's, no, but that's why model, I yeah. think like, it's like the, solu- it was almost a solution that I didn't know we needed, you know, like you never know how that's going to like, maybe that makes things better or I don't know, something that you didn't know we needed. There, There is definitely value in knowing what is good enough, mm-hmm. right? Because like you don't need Photoshop whatever version, like I have the old Photoshop, like you could use that one. And it was good enough for my skill level and what I needed out of the tool. And also, I have, it's wild that you can get Photoshop on your phone now for free. Sure. I have Procreate. I, I bought Procreate on my iPad. I love Procreate. It's a great drawing app and I, I paid the $20 for it and I own it, right? Like I don't and have And they to. have like Canva too. So it's like, it's just what I get. Like I, I do think that when some things get kind of crappy or for customers, it's always a good time. Like I think when, for like innovation, you know, like another company will pop up and be like an, a solution for a problem. So I guess there's that too, but it's just, it's wild. Like you can't really pay things off anymore. Like, yep. Life costs money. Anyway, so much money to our outro. I wanted to talk a little bit about Git again, because uh, Git is, is just central to a lot of things that we do. And I've been using this packaged version of all of these scripts called Git extras. I've been using it for, more than a decade. I don't remember when I found it, but I've been using it forever. And it gives you a bunch of like helpful scripts because everyone, a lot of people know like you can make an alias for Git and like do short commands and just like, oh, it does the Git add, right? Or Git commit with a message or whatever. You could do those things as aliases, but there's also Git commands and anything that in your path that has Git dash some command, if it's executable, can be run as as a Git subcommand. And that's how you can extend Git. Well, this Git extras repo and and package is all just a bunch of community driven, like common commands that you have to do. And it's like, oh, we just want to make a sub command that anyone can rely on. And it works the same way. And in Git extras is that way of packaging it. And the first one that I started using was they have a, a Git PR and the PR command will, will fetch a pull request from an upstream repo and then check it out locally in a branch and track it. And usually that's like three commands. It's like, oh, I got to go like find what number it is and then pull it down. And if it's on my, my branch or someone else's branch, I have to know which one it is. And this get PR is just like get space PR, the number of the PR and then what branch it's from. So if you, if it's your branch, you don't need to put one or I guess the upstream. Or you could say, I want the PR from that upstream and it will just pull it down and check it out and you can run it. And I love that command because it's all that, all the things that I used to do manually. I was like, oh, this is great. I want to keep running this. So I installed the package, the, the Git extras. The other one that I like, there's a few of them. I'm just going to go over them because I've been using it so long and I'm just going to point people to it. Uh, one I used to use a lot was Git standup. It's a standup subcommand, which is you say your name. You used to like Git standup dash a Justin in how many days? So I'm like, oh, our standups once a week. I could do dash D seven. I could say, oh, what did I do in the code over the last seven days? Because I would forget that. It's a great little, and just gives you the, the, your commits. It's just like, what did exactly did you do over some frame? Or you could do it for someone else. Like, oh, what did Autumn do for the last seven days? Like, you can just go run this and like say, these are the commits that landed, right? It's not necessarily all the work you did, but it reminds you of, I was working on this feature or I, this reminded me of something else I did. Um, so I really enjoyed the standup command. PR is the one I use all the time. Git undo. Like, if you want to just undo the last Git commit, Right. Like how many times have I wanted to do that? And like, oh, it's head with the carrot. And like, oh, I need three commits ago. You just do git undo three. And it does that command for you as just it's more of like an alias because it's a one command thing. But it'll undo those commands and, and put you back at the the head that you want to be at. It is easier to use than the syntax that I'm I always have to look up. <laughs> and so I use undo more often. Uh, but there's a bunch of other ones in here. There's stuff like there's stuff that I would have never thought of or wanted to use like git scp where you can like literally like clone your local state of git into another place without like doing this whole like git merge push sort of thing it's just like just push the files over to some other location like a a, another server just copy them there uh git summary is kind of fun because it just looks at all the history of the commit messages says how many commits are there who's committed the most i did it on one of our repos for work and you know one person has like 40% of the commits in this repo. And it's like, yeah, they, they do a lot of work on this repo. And that makes sense. But it shows you like how long it's been around, uh, when the last release was created, all that sort of stuff in a summary. Um, what was the other one I was looking at? Uh, trees kind of set up. That was the one. Git setup is like a git init and then a git add and a git commit. Like all those three commands. 
If you're in a folder that has files you're already starting to work on and you're like, I need this to be a Git repo, you can just type git submit or git setup, sorry, and and it will automatically do that and it's add and then commit uh, three steps to be like, you're in a Git repo now. And all of the files that were in the Git repo are part of the first commit. And, and you don't have to like go through those things. And so I like it. It's just a collection of scripts. You can brew install it as Git extras. Again, I've been using it for such a long time. I occasionally, like probably once a year, I have to go back and look at it because there's going to be more commands that get added because it's just open source and you can PR your favorite subcommand. I was going to say, can you open source like contribute? Yep. They do take contributions. A lot of them will be like features um, that I've seen where it's like, oh, I wanted this one thing that works different than what you were doing uh, before. Um, there was another one, merge, show merge branch, delete merged branches is a great one. It was like, I need to clean up a Git repo. And you just, it's a, it's a delete dash merge dash branches. And it'll just like find all of the branches that have already been merged upstream and it deletes them from your local, you know, repo. So you're like, I don't need to see all these branches anymore because we already merged those. That makes sense. Yeah, so the bunch of like helpful stuff like that, which are usually small-ish scripts, like a, maybe a handful of commands that are Git related. Um, you know, you could go to like the, t the top of the repo, you can do stuff, but you can use these scripts as other automation where it's like, give me, you know, like I have aliases for a lot of stuff. I still use the aliases, but these commands are also helpful for various other things and I really enjoy them. So I wanted to share. That's pretty cool. Yeah, because they're just, they're things that, make your day a little better when you're like, oh, let's let's install this one and try these out. And so yeah, I want to throw that out there because this whole episode has been Git and it's been fun. I really think that it's amazing. Like at first in my career, well, not my career, when I was in college, I was like a little scared of Git. But once you get like using it and stuff, it's amazing the crazy things you can do with Git. You definitely become familiar with enough of Git that you're like, again, it's your skill level, right? Like my Photoshop level and my Git skill level are are, are like the bottom, you know, 30, 40 percent of like everything that it does. I just don't need most of it. Uh, but the things that I know and I'm familiar with it, I can I can work my way through that. And if I need to, I could just blow away the repo and start over and then get back to a state where I'm like, oh, I'm just going to copy these five files and that I. Need. Yeah, sometimes you have to just like throw it all away and start over. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the show, and we still enjoy your feedback. If you have uh, people and topics that you want to have on the show, feel free to email us, ship it at changelog.com, and we will talk to you all next week. Also, help me bully Justin into coffee. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash. Subscribe now if you haven't already. Head to shipit.show for all the ways or just search for Ship It wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find us. Thanks once again to our partners at fly.io to the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder for these dope beats and to Sentry. Use code changelog when you sign up and save 100 bucks off their team plan. That's all for now, but come back next week when we continue discussing everything that happens after Git Push.